Water is the essence of our existence. Without it, there can be no life. Civilizations began next to water. But as populations grow, especially in arid regions, there is not enough to go around. In the past, decisions about water have been guided by a very simple formula, which said, estimate human demands for water and build a new water project to meet it. And that equation was simple and it worked as long as water was abundant. But it's not working anymore because water is becoming scarce. Concrete dams have dominated our management of water in the past 50 years. Dams tested and built to master the power of nature. The story of water has been the story of controlling it. 38,000 large dams have been built in all. Dams to store water and control floods. Dams for irrigation and hydroelectricity. Dams that have inundated canyons and drained wetlands. Now, the dam building era in the United States is coming to a close. The best sites are taken. The economic and environmental costs are too high. And Americans are beginning to turn to conservation. But developing countries seeking to provide water and power for growing populations still covet these engineering marvels. They've sent their best and brightest to be trained by the Bureau of Reclamation builders of the super dams of the American West. Right after Hoover Dam was completed, the world recognized that a great achievement had occurred. And the Bureau of Reclamation was besieged. And we ended up as the training center for young engineers uh, sent here from Thailand, from Turkey, uh, Ethiopia, all around the world, actually. India was an example of uh, everywhere I went in India, they thought I was the second coming of the Buddha. More than any other nation, India has staked its future on large dams. In 1963, Prime Minister Nehru predicted that dams would become the temples of modern India. You have done me in inviting me today. 2,200 dams have created electricity and supplied irrigation to feed the hungry subcontinent. But the dams have taken a heavy human toll. Some 20 million people have lost their homes. In recent years, a controversy has erupted over the damming of the Narmada River. <laughs> To fight the damming of the Narmada, Protesters have gone on mass hunger strikes. Led by Meda Patkar, members of the movement even threatened to drown themselves in the rising floodwaters. Construction has stopped while the government reviews the project. So far, 60 villages have been inundated. It is unclear how India will proceed.
A hemisphere away on the border between Argentina and Paraguay, construction continues on the massive Yasrita Dam. Biologists worry that the reservoir created by the dam will cause an outbreak of schistosomiasis, what some call the disease of hydroelectric dams in the tropics. Snails like these breed in the stagnant reservoirs, releasing a parasitic worm that penetrates human skin, damaging the liver and spleen. People are not the only ones at risk. As this region is flooded, 70 kinds of mammals and 300 bird species will lose their home. In a region where rainforest habitat is rapidly disappearing. Efforts to rescue some of the larger animals rarely succeed. Many will die from the stresses of capture. Where the dam building era is really going uh, gangbusters now is in countries like Indonesia, China, Malaysia, Brazil, uh, other South American countries, Chile. Uh, some of the most beautiful rivers on the planet are now being turned into reservoirs. And some of the biggest dams ever built, bigger than anything that we've built, are being built in countries like Brazil and China. In China, work goes on to build Three Gorges Dam, the world's largest hydroelectric project. Eventually rising 600 feet high and over a mile wide, the dam will create an enormous lake that will stretch nearly 400 miles upstream. China's leaders say Three Gorges will fuel its industrial revolution and save millions of people from frequent floods along the Yangtze River. When it's finished, it's going to be the largest dam in the world. It will supply one-tenth of the electricity for China. Critics of Three Gorges say the project will create a $30 billion bog because silt will build up behind the dam. The project will flood the nation's most beautiful region, as famous in China as the Grand Canyon is in the U.S. Over a million people in Riverside villages will be displaced. Even the World Bank, long a supporter of large dams, has withdrawn from Three Gorges. But China says it will go ahead and find its own financing. In late 1993, Dan Beard, then chief of the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation, withdrew his agency's technical support for Three Gorges. There's no better example of a project we shouldn't be involved in than Three Gorges Dam. We've moved away from water project construction in the United States, and I felt it was hypocritical uh, for us to continue to be involved in the largest dam construction project in the world. Uh, there are better, uh, easier, and cheaper ways to solve uh, the problems of flood control and power production than Three Gorges Dam. Moving from large construction projects to a culture of conservation requires a major change in the way people think about water. Such a transition can take decades. And many developing countries face staggering problems of both water quality and water supply. Mexico City, struggling now to provide water for 20 million people. It's predicted to grow by another 10 million in the next decade. Just where the water will come from remains an open question. A 
Originally built on a system of five lakes, Mexico City began its history rich in water. The Aztecs once farmed floating fields along these canals. This is all that remains of those lakes. Today, three quarters of Mexico City's population enjoys modern plumbing and plenty of water for drinking, showers, and sanitation. But in these sprawling shanty towns, migrants from rural areas lack water for even the most basic human needs. Mexico City faces one of the most difficult challenges of any urban area in the world with regard to water. 18 to 20 million people living in um, a very, very uh, densely populated area. The next best new source of water is a thousand meters below the city. They're very dependent on groundwater and already over pumping that groundwater uh, on the order of 50 to 80 percent. The city's ancient metropolitan cathedral is sinking because of the overpumping. Built after the Spanish conquest in the 16th century, the structure sags dramatically on one side. Wires, joists, metal clamps all support the weakened structure. Some sections of the city are sinking 12 inches a year. quarter of Mexico City's water must be pumped in from a hundred miles away. With antiquated pipes damaged by subsidence and earthquakes, the city loses almost a third of its water to leaks. This is a common problem around the world for cities with aging pipes. Mexico City still celebrates its long love affair with water. But there's a terrible irony in the way rich and poor people get their water. For the well-to-do, piped-in water is cheap and plentiful. For the poor, water is very expensive and hard to come by. Mexico City has a growing population a lot of people are coming in from outside to the city and for the city it's very difficult to provide them with services. In the areas where people don't get much of the water supply, which is the poorer part of the population, they get the water through water trucks that come in bucket by bucket, which is very expensive. Sometimes they have to pay one of the quarter amount of what they earn a day for this water. In this new district, residents were promised piped-in water by local politicians. But so far, they have received no services. Like many of her neighbors, Guadalupe Sanchez Lopez is forced to store her family's water supply in rain barrels. She lives with her children in a two-room house with no running water. Unconnected to any sewer, the toilet represents a hope for the future. It sits over a hole in the ground. For two barrels of water from a local company, Sanchez pays five pesos, a quarter of her family's income of four dollars a day. El problema principal en la falta de agua y en la adecuada eh, distribución del agua principalmente es 
principalmente eh, problemas gastrointestinales y básicamente problemas de salud en general. Young children are at the greatest risk. Child mortality here is 10 times higher than in wealthy sections of the city. And just down the street, sewage and industrial wastes run raw in one of Mexico City's main canals. A common problem in many parts of the developing world. Following a recent outbreak of cholera that claimed lives all over Latin America, Mexico City launched a campaign urging people to boil their drinking water and to wash their hands after going to the bathroom. 80% of illnesses in developing countries can be traced to unsafe water and poor sanitation. Over a billion people in the world don't have access even to basic drinking water and sanitation requirements. Many of these countries are growing in population very, very fast. Many African countries, Middle Eastern countries, their population will double within a generation. Um, so supplying water to meet the drinking water needs, the food needs, the industrial needs of a population growing that fast is extremely difficult. And many of these countries are already water short. The nations of the Middle East are already hitting the limits of their renewable water supplies. With populations predicted to double in 30 years, the Israelis, Jordanians, and Palestinians will have only enough water for urban and industrial use, with little fresh water to grow food. These peoples realize that if they don't cooperate to share their limited water resources, it may mean war. Israel has had long-running disputes with Jordan, Syria, and Lebanon over water rights. Hostilities between the Israelis and the Palestinians over land have run high for decades. But less well-known is the fact that Israel draws one quarter of its water from the occupied territories. Resolving water disputes will require not only diplomacy, but new technologies that can make the most of the region's limited supply. Israel is building hundreds of apartment blocks to accommodate a large influx of immigrants from the former Soviet Union. 700,000 people in three years. To meet its growing needs, Israel is depending more and more on recycled water. We recycle and reuse our dirty shirts. We launder them. You have to learn how to launder water. As more fresh water is diverted to cities, recycled water is the only source that actually grows with population. It's the shadow of the supply. Israel now recycles two-thirds of its water. This facility handles the wastewater of seven cities. Reclaimed water gets used in cooling and sanitation systems. Though not intended for human consumption, the final product does meet drinking water standards. Recycled water is also piped south to irrigate crops. Now at first the farmers were... Farmers are usually pretty, pretty conservative. But as time went on, and particularly during the drought in 1991, Wastewater became a very sought-after resort. Why? Because when the sweet water uh, sources were in short supply, the wastewater was there, and the farmers were clamoring to connect up to the wastewater reuse project. In the blistering heat of the Negev, Israeli farmers have created an agricultural miracle. Pioneering the use of drip irrigation, they have doubled their harvests with the same amount of water. Perforated tubes deliver water directly to the roots of the plants, avoiding evaporation losses. Moisture sensors tell farmers precisely when their crops need water. Drip technology can save a third of the water used in spray methods. However, with any form of irrigation, 
a problem may develop. History tells us that irrigation has periods like in the life of a married couple. There is the honeymoon between the irrigator and the land, and this happens in the beginning like most honeymoons, and after some decades, there is a increasing deterioration of the land as a result of irrigation. Salt brought in by irrigation water concentrates in the soil, damaging its fertility. A historical example is the Fertile Crescent, Iraq of these days, where thousands of years ago, irrigation was used, but the land deteriorated and some of it is as still not recovered from this bad experience with human irrigation. Similar processes are now starting to be seen in every irrigated region all over the world, from California, through the Mediterranean region, to Australia, China, India, and South America. Once salts build up, they must be flushed out with even more water. So over the course of generations, there are limits to how much water can be conserved. The power to remove salt from ocean water has long been a dream, promising almost limitless water for human needs. Desalinated water is already serving some urban populations, those that can afford its high price. But it's unlikely in the foreseeable future to be cheap enough for use in agriculture. The problem with desalination is that it's very energy intensive. It takes a lot of energy to remove salt from water. So at the moment, um, most of the desalination that's happening in the world is in the Persian Gulf. Um, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, United Arab Emirates, they account for about half of all the desalination that's happening, even though they have only a tiny share of the world's population. They're essentially turning oil into water, and they're among the few countries that can afford to do that. Disputes over water in the Mideast go back a long way. According to the Bible, the wells in the land of the Philistines were called hatred and contention. In Gaza and on the west bank of the Jordan River, Israel provides piped-in water to Israeli settlers, while Palestinian citizens have received a more limited supply. <laughs> when it comes to military occupation and fairness, they don't go together. If the current situation continues, I see the Palestinians heading for a water catastrophe. Already we see signs of it in Gaza, where kidney failures as a result of drinking brackish water and unsafe and polluted water. This cannot continue. This is a recipe for disaster. In most Palestinian homes, rainwater is collected and stored in cisterns below ground. Each cistern costs $10,000, an expensive investment for families who only earn half that in a year. A settler in the West Bank consumes seven times more water than a Palestinian in the West Bank. And in Gaza, they consume 14 times more. This is a source of injustice, which is causing many Palestinians to ask, why? We need to have water. Our children drink water exactly like Israeli children. Of all of the people in the Middle East, the Palestinians are those most short of water. And I, as an Israeli, would like to say that without getting into the amounts of water that are under discussion, it should be in Israel's interest to see to it that the Palestinians get a fair deal and get enough water so they feel comfortable for the future. It's in Israel's interest to live in peace with its neighbors. I think 
the potential for conflict is going to persist until we see water sharing agreements that divide the water equitably in each of the major river basins in the Middle East and elsewhere. We're beginning to see countries realize that they have benefits to gain from, from cooperating. And if they continue to see that, we could see water and water scarcity become a motivation for peace rather than war. Half a world away, the tug of war over water goes on in the arid American West. There's a lust for water here that borders on obsession. When people get free time, they head for the nearest water they can find. Rivers, pools, artificial lakes. There are no natural lakes here. Water from the Colorado River has transformed a desert into the fastest growing region of the country. Ten major dams stop up the river and canals siphon off water for irrigation and growing cities. Most of these water projects were constructed before the 1960s and 70s when things began to change. These projects before were built with almost no environmental consideration at all. And then finally the Endangered Species Act, the National Environmental Policy Act came along uh, and those allowed the public into the process. And then the costs began to get outlandish. The best sites had been taken. And so the newer dams uh, were much more expensive for the equivalent amount of water that you might get out of them. And essentially, as the country amassed a greater and greater federal deficit, people began to say, wait a minute, why are we building billion dollar dams when all you have to do is conserve some water and you can get just as much with conservation as you would with supply? The city of Denver was forced to put these new realities to the test. In 1982, the Water Board filed application to build Two Forks Dam to enable the city to store additional water diverted from the Colorado River. In the midst of a growth boom, Denver saw Two Forks as a way to secure the region's future. What city officials didn't anticipate was an overwhelming protest from environmental groups, fishermen, biologists, and ordinary citizens. It really was the last dance of the dinosaurs. It was developed in an era when we thought about water only as its value in being taken from the stream to supply cities and to supply agriculture. We're now in the mode where we think about water in its natural course as valuable in its own right. Two Forks Dam was to be located 25 miles from Denver on the South Platte River. It would flood a 28-mile stretch of land, including Cheeseman Canyon and a prime trout fishery. You can't understand what a dam does and what a reservoir is unless you've been there before the construction. And if you go out to Two Forks, what you find is the narrowing of a great canyon, a very efficient place to put in a 60-story high cement plug. But it is a place you don't want to lose. And people went there, and they spoke out in different ways and said, we don't want to lose that place. There was more than Cheeseman Canyon at stake. The Platte River flows north into Nebraska. Biologists worried that Two Forks Dam would pirate the Platte River's flow, strangling wetland habitat for migratory birds. All around us right now, we're hearing the sound of the sandhill cranes that visit the Platte every spring as part of the greatest migration of cranes that occurs on the face of the earth. They gather on this river in numbers that are truly astounding. Half a million sandhill cranes gather here each spring. And here in central Nebraska, they have the perfect combination of flowing water, a shallow river, fields of food for them to eat. And in this gathering, we have one of the greatest spectacles in North America. 
And people come here from all over the country and all around the world to see this event because it's unmatched anywhere else. Dams have impact not just upstream in the area that gets flooded by a reservoir, but downstream throughout the entire system where the blockage of flow alters the way the river flows downstream and can alter the habitat significantly. The Platte River used to be over a mile wide. Today, diversions for irrigation have reduced its flow by 70% squeezing migratory birds into smaller and smaller areas of habitat. Towns and communities along the Platte have finally come to the realization that the kinds of flows they need to sustain drinking water supplies and to just generally provide for a healthy human environment are very similar to the kinds of flows that we've been saying are needed to sustain an ecosystem. So in a very real sense, what happens to the cranes is an indication of what's happening to us and the human community here on the flat. Still, the question remained, how to provide for Denver's growth? As the debate over Two Forks raged on, Denver spent $45 million on land and environmental impact studies and nearly received a permit to build the dam. But at the 11th hour, the project was vetoed by the Environmental Protection Agency. All in all, we were able to demonstrate that you could supply 20% more water than Two Forks for half the cost of Two Forks and for one-tenth or one-twentieth the environmental damage. Whenever cities have expensive capital projects to look at, you can almost always demonstrate conservation makes more sense than building a new project. We want water for our cities, and hydropower is important, but so are wild rivers. And we feel that as a people, and we feel what a river really can be, a place of magic and mystery and beauty. And we've made up our mind now that we are going to keep some rivers wild, both for what they can give to us as a people, and, and also to the animals and the plants that depend upon them, and also, I think, out of some ultimate respect for the river itself. Denver now had to look within to figure out how to meet its, its water needs without a new source of water. And what Denver found is that a gallon of water saved through conservation and efficiency is just as good as a gallon supplied from a new dam like Two Forks. In fact, it's better because uh, it doesn't involve destroying a beautiful place like Cheeseman Canyon. Denver has since been encouraging conservation citywide. It turned out that just installing water meters made homeowners more conscious of how much they use. The water board raised water rates and now gives cash payments to businesses that adopt efficiency measures. We are beginning a pilot program that will pay a business uh, three times what they would pay us for the water if they save that water permanently. Now, it's a one-time payment of up to $20,000, but if that business installs water-saving hardware that will save us a good deal of water in the long run, we will pay them for it. City Ice was one of the first local companies to undergo a water audit. The biggest item was to try to do something with process water that was coming off our ice-making operation. We were able to end up with about a 1.5 million gallon reduction in our water usage on an annual basis. Water from the ice making process was reclaimed for use as a cooling agent in refrigeration. Many businesses could cut their water use in half by reclaiming water for rinse cycles and cooling systems. One of the best ways homeowners can conserve is to try a landscaping idea pioneered in Denver. It's called Xeriscape, and it involves selecting plants, 
trees and ground cover native to the region or that require only small amounts of water, like buffalo grass. Overwatering a lawn is the single biggest household waste of water. We've got to move toward pricing water at somewhere near its value. We currently give it away. In fact, sometimes we pay people to take it. What? It's ludicrous that the most fundamental resource that we have, the one that is fundamental to life, is a resource in which we're giving it away. We waste water in ways that you can't imagine. Does this completely modernize dishwashing? Every housewife in the land will answer, yes. The American dream of the 1950s was to have all the modern conveniences. And just think of the thousands of hours that your hands don't have to soak in dishwater. Washers, disposals, and dishwashers, all running on unlimited supplies of water. In fact, the more dishes you have, the more time you save. Today, the average American family of four uses 300 gallons of water a day. Enough to fill this bathtub 20 times. In Tucson, Arizona, at the Casa del Agua, or House of Water, a conventional home has been retrofitted with water-saving devices to see just how much an average family could save. Glenn and Catherine France have lived here for 10 years, raising their family and monitoring every drop of water. Here at the Casa del Agua house, we use about half of what a typical home uses. That water is the potable water that I'm talking about. We also use water that is harvested from the roof, which is rainwater, and we use gray water, which is the water from the kitchen sinks, the bathtub, the shower, and the washing machine. Fixtures have been equipped with low-flow shower heads and faucets. Recycled gray water and rainwater collected from the roof irrigate the family's Xeriscape garden. Studies show that the best way to save water indoors is to replace the old 6-gallon per flush toilet with a new 1.6-gallon model, saving 21 gallons per person per day. Low-water use toilets have been used here ten years ago, and as a result of the research that we did here on those toilets, local plumbing codes have been adopted, and now the national standard has been adopted for the use of the 1.6-gallon per flush toilets. Casa del Agua is just one example of innovative programs around the world that are proving conservation can make a big difference. But households use only 10% of water worldwide, and industries claim only 25%. Agriculture uses the greatest share, 65% worldwide, and even more here in the Southwest. A desert wasteland from which the bustling metropolis of Los Angeles was built. How, you ask? From water, imported water. So engineers have designed an ingenious way to import water from the mighty Colorado River to quench the thirst of this area's growing population. So now, Southern California can rest assured that it will remain the golden land of opportunity and oranges. Today, California uses more than its legal share of the Colorado. Someday it may have to give up that water. So more and more, California is looking toward conservation. Historically, we've viewed water conservation as something that we do in the middle of a drought. And once the drought is over, we forget about it. It can't be that way anymore. Water conservation can make a tremendous difference. The water system, if you will, is probably the most inefficient system we have uh, for any resource. In California's Imperial Valley, irrigation water from the Colorado River is brought in by canals managed by the Bureau of Reclamation and paid for by U.S. taxpayers. No. Farming here is a billion dollar business and farmers get their water practically free. All they pay is the cost of delivery. Dating back to the 19th century, water rights in this valley are tied to the land. Since water is so cheap, there has been little incentive to invest in conservation. 
The Imperial Irrigation District slurps up about uh, a quarter of the Colorado River, maybe 20% uh, of it, to irrigate 400,000 acres of land. Uh, very permeable land and a scorching climate, so uh, very high water demand. Now, a lot of people have complained about that uh, for a long time as perhaps the ultimate example of inefficiency. The IID now is beginning to think about selling some of this water to Los Angeles. Uh, and I personally think that's a good idea. Los Angeles is really paying for the efficiency improvements and then paying for the water as well. Like this pump back system that recaptures surface runoff. Paid for by the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California. MWD gets to keep the water saved and the farmer gets to keep the system. In new water marketing deals, farmers are beginning to sell their water to cities like San Diego. It's a good way for thirsty cities to find new supplies. But it can create windfall profits for landowners selling water that's been subsidized at taxpayer expense. The billionaire Bass Brothers of Texas recently bought 30,000 acres here and hope to market some of the water that goes with their land. We've got to stop giving away water as if it was a free good. You have farmers wasting water and you have millions of people who uh, need additional water supplies. Well, it doesn't take a genius to figure out that it's going to be in a very short period of time. Someday we're going to have a vote about this. Agriculture accounts for the lion's share of the world's water and a very large share on the order of 80 to 85 percent in most of the western U.S. So this is really the, the biggest pool of water that, that we have. Saving even a tiny share of water in agriculture can free up a lot of water to meet new urban needs. Cities like Los Angeles are looking for ways to reduce the water they use and to reclaim and reuse water before they dispose of it. The Metropolitan Water District works with local groups like Mothers of East Los Angeles to encourage residents to install low-flow toilets. Started by Juana Gutierrez, the organization is now run by her daughter, Elsa Lopez. We have given approximately about 85,000 toilets and that will be a savings of 7.6 billion gallons of water a year. People bring in their old water-guzzling toilets and exchange them for the new low-flow models. Residents benefit by saving on their water bills. And the mothers of East L.A. get $25 for each old-fashioned toilet they collect for the city. The crushed toilets become road beds for freeways. The new toilets save the city 8 million gallons a day. We're really excited about having the water conservation program and the results that have come from it, saving all those gallons of water and saving the community money and bringing in jobs for them. Let's stop up right over here. Each year, Lopez takes teenagers from East L.A. 300 miles north to Mono Lake so they can see where some of their water comes from. It's an unusual mountain lake rimmed with strange natural structures made of lime. They're called tufa towers. How old is the tufa? Yeah. This tufa in this grove is probably, some of it's as old as a thousand years but a lot of it's really young, 75 to 200 years, and yet it's above ground, and tufa only forms underwater. So we know that the lake has dropped pretty quickly. Mono Lake was recently the center of heated environmental controversy. The lake's level had drained down because water from its feeder streams was being diverted to Los Angeles. But a state water board decision in 1994 stopped the diversions, and now its waters are slowly rising. Pour off a little of the excess water. Mono Lake is a place that captures people's hearts and minds. I think what we all realize is that there are Mono Lakes at the ends of all of our taps, or these special places that are the source 
of our water supplies. In the future, conservation and recycling will become even more important to Los Angeles. The loss of water from Mono Lake has increased the need to conserve. The city also knows that it will eventually have to give up some of the Colorado River water on which it depends, water that belongs to states upstream. And by treaty, a portion of the Colorado's water belongs to Mexico. There's a very fundamental problem with the Colorado River. There was a very rainy year, and then all the politicians sat down to divide up the amount of water, and they made a, a very large mistake. They divided up more water than they've ever had since. Uh, it hasn't rained as much and haven't had as much water uh, since the time that they divided it up. So what you have is uh, you've over-allocated that river. You've given away more water than you really had. The seven states and two nations that share the Colorado have been described as thirsty dogs fighting over a damp sponge. This is one of the few wetlands remaining in the Colorado Delta, just south of the border. It gives a small idea of what the Delta used to be like before dams upstream diverted the river's waters. In 1922, the great American conservationist Aldo Leopold paid a visit to the Colorado Delta and wrote about it in a marvelous essay in the San County Almanac, his, his masterwork. Uh, what he found there was a paradise for wildlife. There were jaguars, cougars, bobcats, teamed with waterfowl. It's so ironic that in that year, the Colorado River Compact was signed, and that began shutting off the flow of water to the Delta. So the Delta is now a star, and it's essentially a dead zone. Everything that Leopold saw there is gone. Leopold described the Colorado Delta as a milk and honey wilderness full of a hundred green lagoons. The region provided habitat for species that live mostly in zoos today. Endangered creatures like the jaguarundi, lynx, and Mexican wolf. Today, the Colorado Delta has been transformed into miles of dried out salt flats. Except in the wettest years, the river no longer makes it to the Gulf of California, its historic destination. Virtually nothing is reaching the delta in an average year. And so the ecosystem has been completely changed um, and the native communities that have relied on this ecosystem and this water for thousands of years are now suffering and very much in decline themselves. Fisheries in this region are in severe trouble in part because of overfishing but also because diversions of water upstream have damaged the Delta spawning grounds. The Kokopa Indians who live in the Delta once had a thriving culture of fishing and riverbank farming. <laughs> Their way of life is now in jeopardy. Weeds choke the river behind their village. It's barely a foot deep. Today, for their household needs, the Cocopa rely upon water brought in by the barrel. They say bathing is basically a teacup affair. 
As for fishing, the Kokopo must now haul their boats 40 miles to get to the saltwater channel of the Gulf of California. By the time they've bought fuel for both the trucks and the boats, it becomes a costly trip. <laughs> Fishing is a community activity for the Kokopa, but it's mainly the young men who go out in the boats. These waters were once rich fishing grounds, and fishermen's gill nets were filled with corvina and totuaba. But on this day, they catch nothing. Finally, after many hours of effort, they give up and head for home. It is a very long trip indeed. The community's young people still hold fast to the tribe's identity as river people. They've chosen the name pescadores, or fishermen, for the soccer team. But as their parents know, their future is clouded by the problems with the Colorado River. Perhaps, if the true potential of conservation could be realized and the benefits distributed fairly, there would someday be enough water for everyone. To restore the Colorado River Delta will take a lot and it's probably impossible to go back to what it used to be last century. But it's also a lot of things that can be done with just allowing some water to come in at particular times of the year. And I think a good important lesson is when we look at other deltas, we should now carefully look at the environmental impacts that damming and irrigation projects will have. We should not repeat what we did with the Colorado River because those things do not reverse. In the end, we may need a new water ethic, an ethic that says it's important now to begin sharing water with each other as well as with nature. There's an old proverb that goes something like, uh, the frog does not drink up the pond in which it lives. And I think it's a very simple wisdom, but it, it really captures the challenge, I think, that we're facing, which is how we're going to meet our growing human needs for water and still live in balance with the ecosystems that support all life.